Hi everybody! Welcome back to Echo. It's uh, It's been a few days since I was last able to record one of these. I'm kinda rusty, but I will do my best to power through it as we continue along through Carl's route. So, let's get started. Dudes, I just... I don't know about this. I peek into the bathroom, watching as Carl stares at himself in the mirror, running his fingers through his hair. You look great! Raven stands back, grinning with a tremor in his paws, looking Carl up and down. Tell him, Chase! Carl looks at me, and I have to agree that he looks quite a bit better. You look fantastic. A lot cleaner. Thanks. Now take a shower! Before Carl can say anything, Raven shoves them all back into Carl's chest before slamming the door in his face. Man, this is going to be great! If the interview was based on looks alone, he'd have that job locked. Yeah, probably. And so with that, we move to the living room and wait. Half an hour later, Carl shuffles in quietly. We don't even know he's there until he clears his throat. Uh, so, uh, how does it look? He looks good, but I'm more concerned with the fact that he looks more insecure than I've ever seen him. He shifts from hoof to hoof, not making eye contact at all. His fingers pulling at the rolled up sleeves. Oh my god, that looks fantastic! There's no way you won't get that job now! Raven sounds genuine enough, but then again he's always excited. Carl looks over at me and I give a start, realizing how bad my silence must have seemed. You do look great, Carl. But uh... Raven chuckles and Carl's eyes widen. What? The beanie. Do you always wear that thing? Carl lifts a paw to it. Usually. You can't wear that. How do you even get it on? It's stretchy, and my hood fur looks awful. Seriously, you can't wear a beanie to an interview. Carl's getting all fidgety again, so I butt in. That's probably fine. Hey, I actually think it looks kind of nice with everything else you've got on. Carl glances at me, but stops fidgeting with the beanie. Raven looks at me, then back to Carl. Well, alright. Carl sighs and shifts around again. We watch him expectantly. Dudes, this just... This feels weird is all. It's new. You'll get used to it. I pull out my phone to look at the time. Alright, we really need to head out. We should get there early. As we head to the door, Raven makes us have to follow us. I kick myself for forgetting to talk to him earlier. I turn around to face him as Carl heads out the door. Hey, Raven? He stops. What's up? So, after the interview, me and Carl... and our other friends... We're gonna be doing something. Raven raises his brows. Oh? Oh, it's not that we don't want you to come. Though I really wouldn't mind having his upbeat attitude present at what will surely be the biggest downer of the week. It's just that... it's really personal. Oh, really? Yeah. Seriously, you wouldn't want to come. We're gonna be talking about some heavy shit. Raven seems to perk up a little at that. Oh, well, I wouldn't want to intrude. I'll just hang out here then. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be back soon, okay? Sounds good, but you have to tell me how the interview goes. I know he's going to do amazing! I will, and he will. See you in a few. Carl looks confused as I come out to the car alone. Where's Raven? I sit down and make a show of buckling my seatbelt. Uh, so, I wanted to tell you this after the interview so you didn't have more to stress out over. What? I pause as I back out, pretending to be distracted so I can gather my thoughts. So, Leo wants us to meet up at the lake. The lake? The lake? Yeah. Why? Closure, he says. Carl stays quiet as we drive through Echo and I swerve to avoid all the potholes. As I'm merging onto the highway, he finally speaks up. I think that's a good idea. Like, we've been sitting on this for how long? We should do it while we got the chance. I nod my agreement. I just hope everyone else feels the same. We fall back into silence, and it stays that way for the remaining 20 minute drive. 
Carl gets more nervous the closer we get. I can see his knees bouncing out of the corner of my eye as he stares out the window. I reach out and put a paw on his shoulder as we pull into the parking lot of the print shop. You look awesome and you're gonna do amazing. Carl starts taking deep breaths, staring out the windshield. Just be yourself. Everyone loves a relaxed employee. I wish you'd let me have a smoke before we left. Yeah, going to an interview smelling like pot, great idea. Carl gigg giggles nervously, but otherwise doesn't move. Do you want me to go in with you? Carl shakes his head quickly, unbuckling his seatbelt as he opens the car door. No, man, I'll... I'll be fine. Okay, cool. I'll be waiting. I grin at him, but he just shuts the door and ambles up to the print shop. He pushes on the doors, and when they don't move, he pushes harder, shaking the glass. I start to open my door to tell him to pull instead, but he seems to figure it out before I have to and disappears inside. Oh, Carl. Then, I sit back and wait. I try to take a nap since I've been up all night with Raven and Carl gaming, but the heat beating down through the windows becomes too uncomfortable. I turn the AC back on, then shuffle through the stations, but I can only find twangy country and mariachi. I look at the time. 10.10am. If the interview started on time, then he was probably almost done with it by now. I sort of want to go inside, but I know Carl wouldn't want me to. I settle back again and close my eyes, trying to get some relief from the failing AC. Then the door rattles and I hear haphazard hoof steps. I open my eyes, but no one's there. I do catch some movement disappearing around the side of the store, and I lean around to get a better look. I wait, but Carl, at least I think it's Carl, doesn't come back from around the corner. Looking around, I slowly open my door. Carl? Nothing. Carl? I yell it, but he still doesn't come out. I'm feeling some dread build up in my stomach. I get out of the car and slowly walk around the side of the building. It's an alley, between the print shop and what I think is a laundromat. Nothing is in the alley except for a few dumpsters and clumps of garbage. I step carefully around puddles covered in oil slick and wonder if maybe he just really wanted to smoke. Carl? Something shifts on the other side of one of the dumpsters and I hear sniffling. Wordlessly, I walk around the dumpsters to the other side. Carl is bent over, his back to me, paws on his knees. His whole body is shaking and his breaths are ragged. Holy shit, Carl! I met his side instantly, rubbing his back. What happened? Are you alright? The stench of vomit hits my nose, and I don't need to look closely to know what the puddle between Carl's hooves is. Carl makes sure to turn his face away from me, not saying a word. Shit. I dash back to the car and open the passenger door so I can get to the glove box. I pull out a few napkins before hurrying back to the ram. He takes them from me wordlessly and starts wiping his face. The last time I'd seen Carl like this was just last year, when he'd had his panic attack at school. I didn't think he'd have that problem now, after all that therapy and time away. I try to rub his back comfortingly, in a clockwise motion like my mom would do for me. He's at least not hyperventilating. He has his horns pressed up against the wall, taking deep breaths as he wipes his face again. <sighs> Why do we suck at everything? He says it quietly, between gasps, but I can make it out. No, Carl, you're fine. Let's just get you home. I start to pull on his arm, but he yanks it from me violently. Don't touch me! I'm stunned into silence. I just stare at him, mouth open. He glances at me and his eyes are red, and for once it's not because of weed. Carl starts off toward the car on his own, spitting off to the side as he does. Carl? Carl, what happened? He whirls on me. I fucked up! Obviously! Any more fucking questions? His voice breaks apart on the last sentence, and he turns away from me as his face starts to screw up. My stomach feels hollow as I watch Carl get into my car. I've never, ever seen him like this. He immediately hunches forward, head in his paws. I slowly walk up to the driver's side door, feeling like crying myself. I sit for a while, waiting to see if Carl is going to say anything. He does. I'm sorry. 
He blurts it out through his fingers. I look over at him, scared to say anything in case I say the wrong thing. I just... It was a disaster, man. He takes in a deep, shuddering breath. You could tell I wasn't into it right away. That was awkward as fuck. He leans back and tugs at his shirt. This shit, this isn't me. And they knew it and it got me nervous. I've been nervous ever since I got my clothes. Since I got this stupid trim. At that moment it feels as if I've been punched in the stomach. I'm just now remembering the conversation we had on Wednesday. I close my eyes for a moment, not wanting to believe I'd become exactly what he said I wasn't, what he liked me for not being. We sit in silence for a long, long time, until Carl finally looks at me and smiles. God damn it. We both knew this was going to happen, didn't we? I... I don't know, man. And fuck me very much for taking it out on you. It is sort of my fault. Nope. I'm the one that screwed up the interview. Carl settles back in his seat. Now with that fuck up out of the way, on to the next one. I force a smile. You sure you still want to go? Hell no! But I don't think we have much of a choice. I sigh, looking out at the hazy horizon, in the direction of where I know Echo is. Can't wait. So with that, I turn on the ignition and pull out of the parking lot, leaving the print shop in its alley far, far behind us. Leo, TJ, Flynn, and Jenna are all gathered around a picnic table. It's set out neatly on concrete in front of the rocky shore of the lake. None of this existed when we were kids. In fact, it didn't exist when I left. Echo is trying really hard to stay alive. I don't need to get out of the car to gauge the mood my friends are in. Their shoulders slumped, faces turned away from each other. As I park, Leo's ears perk and he turns to wave at us. I take a deep breath and turn to Carl. You ready? Nope. Nevertheless, he opens his door and steps out, and I do the same. The sun beats down on us, but being this close to the lake cools things down a bit. As we approach, I see Leo with his butt up against the edge of the table, while TJ sits next to him. Jenna sits next to TJ, while Flynn sits across from Jenna. When Flynn turns around, he immediately zeroes in on Carl. What the hell happened to you? Drugs, sex, and rock and roll. Out of order, bud. No, I just put it in the appropriate descending order. Flynn rolls his eyes, then looks at me. Hey, fuckboy. Maybe you can talk some fucking sense into this idiot. Leo's ears are flat, but he doesn't look at Flynn. Glad you guys could make it. Sure. Carl sits down next to Flynn, and I sit on Carl's other side, across from TJ. The silence that follows is possibly the most awkward one of the week. Flynn snickers. <laughs> See? This is stupid. How about we let it happen naturally, Flynn, instead of using every moment to take shots at people? Jenna's tone is icy. She hasn't even acknowledged me or Carl. TJ, meanwhile, keeps his head down poking a sharp claw into the soft wood of the table. Flynn shrugs and starts to do his trademark I-don't-give-a-fuck lean back pose, but gives a start when he realizes there isn't any backing on the bench. Well, we've been sitting here for the past 20 minutes and nothing's happened. Maybe you want to start us off? Flynn sighs. <sighs> well, we could talk about how I never agreed to this shit. How Leo's a complete fucking idiot for forcing this to happen, and that I wonder what he thought this would accomplish anyway. That's a start, I guess. Flint sets his jaw. Of course, talk that would actually get us somewhere wouldn't be for me, and he's not talking. The temperature seems to lower in the impossibly hot air, and I don't look at TJ to see how he reacts. After a brief silence, Leo speaks up. How about we start with you, Flynn? Flynn looks at Leo, brows raised. How do you feel about what happened? I see Flynn clench his jaw. What? His tone sends shivers down my spine, and I feel Carl tense up next to me. I look out across the lake, the shimmering reflections blinding me. You never talked about it. Maybe it'll help? Sweat pours down the back of my neck, builds up under my arms. 
Even with the wind coming off the lake, it's way too hot. By telling you how I fucking feel? HOW THE FUCK DO YOU THINK I FEEL?! Flynn screams it and TJ jumps in front of me. You just gonna keep it buried your whole life, Garobo? I think about the time I used to come down to this spot every day and skip rocks with Jenna and TJ. So this is how you plan to fucking get us over this? By fucking making fun of me? I'm not making fun of you. I'm trying to help you. Taunting someone who's felt like shit for a decade is a pretty weird way of helping. Please, guys. Don't you even fucking talk right now! Don't you dare talk to him like that! We all went through this! Calm down, Flynn. The table shakes as Flynn slams his fist down on the wood, snarling and standing up. Tell me to calm down one more fucking- Just shut the hell up! I stand up. Everyone turns to look at me, including Flynn. I don't say anything. Instead, I just strip off my shirt. The hell are you doing? I don't answer him. Instead, I take off my belt and slide off my pants so that I'm only left in my boxers. Without a word, I head to the lake. It's about a hundred yards from the tables to the lake, and while most of the way there is sand, a good stretch of it is pointy rocks. I make my way carefully over this section, remembering the numerous cuts I'd gotten as a kid. I don't look back until I'm right at the water's edge, and when I do, I see Leo following me in the process of taking his own shirt off. The rest of them are still sitting at the table, but I don't care because this is really just for me. I step into the water and sigh at how cool it is before I wade out further. Once I'm waist deep, I dive under the water and pop up several feet further away from the shore. I'm neck deep at this point, and when I look back, I can see Carl now, standing at the lake's edge, paws deep in his pockets. Behind him, Jenna is helping TJ across the rocks. Only Flynn remains behind at the table, watching us all. Leo's up to his chest at this point, and I swim in a circle around him before diving under, then popping up right in front of him. Gah! Sneaky otter! He splashes water on my face, and I cough. <coughs> Don't be that way! I swim around him some more and laugh at how he flounders after me. He was always a terrible swimmer. I dive under the water again and swim up toward the shore, popping up about ten feet away from Carl. Having fun? He's smiling, looking a lot more relaxed than he has all day, probably because we just avoided the situation that could have gotten really ugly. To my left, Jenna and TJ are sitting on a boulder in the shallows. TJ's slacks roll up to his knees. Him and Jenna seem to be talking, so I decide not to play the same trick on them as I did with Leo. Flynn, meanwhile, is standing up now, arms folded. For the next little while, I swim around, occasionally popping up in front of Carl or Leo, sometimes splashing them with my tail. There's a freeing feeling about finally swimming in this lake again and having so much space. Flynn, after a good twenty minutes, comes out to the shore. He leans against an old, familiar boulder, watching us. There's no way for me to know how they're all feeling, if it's liberating like it is for me. Flynn is right, in a way. We can't just talk about it because there's nothing to really say. What happened, happened, and no amount of talking can fix it. What we can do, or what I can do at least, is choose to move past it. And that's what I'm doing now. I just hope that's what they're feeling, too. Eventually, I run out of the exhilarating energy that had so consumed me, and instead drift to the bottom of the shallows. I lay on my back against the sand, staring up the murky glow of the sun. I feel my eyelids get heavy, and I stretch out against the soft lake bed. It is, of course, a bad idea to fall asleep underwater. If that were to happen, though, I'd probably just try to breathe, get a nose full of water, and immediately wake up. Still, I decide that it's best I avoid that, if I can, and force myself to open my eyes again and swim to the surface. Except... I can't. I'm frozen. Every nerve in my body is on fire, and I struggle not to panic. To not start trying to breathe, because that's all my body wants to do. I close my eyes, will myself to be calm. Sleep paralysis usually only lasts about a minute at most for me. 
I can hold my breath for eight, and I've only been under for... God, I have no idea. It feels like it's been a while. My chest has already started to burn, and that usually means it's been at least six minutes. And this is starting to last a long time. Despite my efforts, panic starts to set in, and it sets in quick. I start jerking my body around, trying to get something, anything to move. I don't understand why I'm not floating to the surface. I'm not trying to stay underwater. The seconds turn into minutes, and now my lungs are really burning. Something has to be holding me down. Maybe some kind of vegetation. The water begins to glow red, as if blood is spread across the surface above me. I tug and pull, praying that this is all a dream, that I'm back in Carl's room, and that at any moment I'll wake up. You thought it would be this easy? That's a good one. I try to turn my head toward the voice, which is right in my ear, even though I'm underwater. Things go silent again. At this point, I start to contemplate that I might actually die. I can't get my body to move. None of my friends know where I'm at. And now I'm almost out of air. Bubbles flow past my lips as my lungs finally give out, and blackness starts to crowd in on my vision. He's waking up! My eyes open slowly, painfully, and I'm face to face with the ram, his muzzle wet with tears. <sighs> oh my god, he is! Give him room! I feel some rough paws supporting my back, turning me on my side. Can you breathe, Chase? Leo's voice is ragged next to my ear. Y yeah, no, I'm fine. I sit up quickly, and a wave of dizziness threatens to topple me over again. I feel movement behind me, out of my field of vision. No. No, no, NO! I can't believe this! I can't fucking believe this! Flynn's voice is torn and ragged. I barely recognize it. Calm down, Flynn. NO! We're forced to come here and then this shit happens?! Guys... I have... I need to go... TJ! Flynn, get over here! I feel Leo's support leave me. Carl is still crouched down in front of me, though. Oh my god, dude. What happened? Carl's gasping, like he's the one that was just underwater. I... I don't know. Carl rubs on my back as I rest my head in my paws. Vaguely, I can hear more yelling behind me. And Carl looks up, too. No, no, don't! Leo, help! Despite my aching head, I turn around and see Flynn chasing TJ, grab him, and throw him down onto the rocks. Flynn doesn't get any further, though, because Leo tackles him with such force they fly a good five feet before smashing down into the rocks and sand. Leo wraps an arm around Flynn's neck and yanks up hard. Jesus. Carl stands up and starts gasping again. I try to, but I fall back down on my ass. Carl reaches down to help me up. Shit, you're not okay. Carl steadies me, but I'm distracted with trying to see what's happening. Leo's leaning down with his muzzle right up against Flynn's head, yelling at him. Meanwhile, Jenna's crouched over TJ. Carl starts to breathe heavily again, his wheezing picking up speed. I look over at him and his eyes are glazed, as if he's watching everything from afar. Carl... Carl, what's wrong? I don't want him having another panic attack. I know I should probably stay and try to help, but I feel so fucked up right now. Besides, I don't think it will help if Carl has a breakdown. I grab his arm. Let's... Let's get out of here, Carl. He looks at the scene a while longer, then turns away. Without another word, we make our way back to the car. I get in, barely noticing that I'm drenching the seat. Looking through the windshield, I see that my friends are still in the same position that we left them. Except Jenna. She watches us as we pull out and keeps watching us until we're out of sight. Carl stays in his glazed state as we make the short drive back to his house. I can't give him much of my attention, though. 
I'm more preoccupied with the fact that something terrible just happened. Not only to me, but the entire group. Maybe this is a dream? Everything feels so surreal right now. Like I'm watching all of this happen from a hundred miles away. I can't... I don't know. I look over at Carl, but his expression is still glassy. He looks exactly like how I'm feeling. What's wrong, Carl? I don't know. You don't... I'm cut off as a large coyote suddenly runs out into the street. But she's a good distance down the road, so there's no danger of me hitting her. I watch as she tears out into the sagebrush, zigzagging about, arms flinging out in all directions. Carl and I both watch her as we pass, silent. Something's happening in this town. To all of us. Once we get into the house, Carl heads straight for the stairs. Carl! You guys back? How'd you go? Raven's voice calls from upstairs. Ray, something's wrong. Huh? What's wrong? I don't answer as I walk to the stairs Carl just disappeared down. Once I get there, he's already gone. I make my way down the stairs, and it's at that point that my headache starts to make a comeback. Carl? He's not in the basement either, but I can see the yellow light glowing from the crawl space. Something... I don't know what it is, but something feels incredibly wrong right now. Buzzing fills my head, the ground feeling unsteady, as if I'm walking on sand. Once I find Carl, we're both going to the hospital. I stumble down into the crawl space, and, again, Carl's not there. I greeted to the familiar row of tubs, but a stack of them have been pulled away from the wall. Carl? Carl, what? I fall silent because ahead of me is a hole, about three feet high and two feet wide. What the hell? Carl? Plaster covers the tarp around it, as if the wall had been bashed violently to create the hole. Did Carl go through it? Getting on my paws and knees, I look into it, but the darkness is inky and so black I swear I can touch it. As I crawl forward, my mind gives a violent jolt and I arch my head back teeth bared as my face spasms, and then I fall, and it feels like I fall forever. Wind blows pleasantly through my fur seeping underneath and cooling my sweating skin. The smells of the desert, sagebrush and dirt, overwhelm my senses. Everything is black around me, but there are a million stars above me. I hear the smattering of small feet running circles around my body, snuffling of noses up against my sides and neck. Mixed into the, into the sounds of the wild are words, languages I don't understand, chanting and singing, the sounds of dancing, then in another language. I hear a word or two that I learned from Leo years ago, and then my own language. And above it all is a maniacal cackling, one that builds and fades before choking off into a sob. The first feeling I have is one of confusion. I feel stiff and cold, and I'm lying back on something hard. I expect to see stars above me when I open my eyes, but instead all I see is blackness. Panic starts to well up inside me. My breathing quickens and, though it's hard and painful, I manage to push myself up into a sitting position. That's when I see a gentle glow coming from an opening about 30 feet away from me. Where am I? The last thing I remember was the lake. Wait, no. Carl's house is the last thing I remember. We went back to his house after the lake. Did I fall asleep in his house somewhere? I feel around on the floor with my hands and can feel wood underneath me. It creaks as I shift around. Carl? My voice comes out hard and crackly. I have to lick my lips several times to keep them from sticking together. I call out again, but more softly this time, because now I'm starting to wonder if someone else brought me here. 
When I don't hear anything, I start to crawl forward towards the light. My head throbs a little, and there's a coppery taste in my mouth. Probing my tongue around, I taste the sour of bites along my cheeks. I start to run through a list of things that could have happened. I was in Carl's basement, then I just sort of seized up. Did someone hit me over the head? I stop crawling and start moving my hands around my body and over my head. No. No sign of any injuries. Aside from the cheek bites, it's really just the inside of my head that hurts. While I do this, lucidity starts to return in waves as if a dam has broken, and all of my senses are falling back into place. At the same time, the panic starts to return as I realize how much this doesn't make sense. Someone had to have brought me here, wherever here is. I start crawling again, trying to keep my panic under control. I'm almost to the glow, but it's weird because it's coming from the ground. As I get closer, I hear a soft brushing behind my head. I tense and look over my shoulder. I'm greeted by the sight of inky blackness. It's so dark that it almost feels alive, and I get the impression of a giant mouth opening up in front of my face. The image gives me a jolt and I lunge forward, deciding to get up on my feet so I can move fast. And then I'm falling, but not for long. My senses are full of light now, and I throw my hands forward to catch myself. But I keep falling, and the split second before I hit, I realize there's a ladder. I instinctively grab at it, but my head hits the rungs first, and I flip forward before landing on my feet. It happens on weak ankles, though, and my right foot gives out of my ankle rolls. I hear a series of pops before the rest of my body hits the floor. I lay there for a moment, the sudden noise and violence of the fall stunning me. Excuse me for a second. In my stupor, I feel a cold spiderweb of electricity pulsing from my ankle, and that's what spurs me to move. I pull myself into a sitting position to clutch at it. Fuck. The pain isn't really bad, but something is definitely wrong, and I'm not sure if I can just walk it off. That's when I notice my surroundings. A long hallway stretches out to either side of me, lit by decorative chandeliers. Looking up, I see that I've fallen down a drop-down ladder from a small square in the ceiling. What the hell? I look back down at my ankle. I wiggle it around and immediately feel another pulse of electricity that feels much more painful than this time around. I grit my teeth as I spread my hands out against the wall behind me, pushing myself up slowly, making sure not to put any weight on my injured ankle. As I'm doing this, I hear a soft clopping sound coming from my right. At the end of the hall, it looks like it takes a sharp right, and it sounds like the noises are coming from that turn. My throat tightens, and I press myself harder up against the wall. I see a shadow slide up the carpet at the end of the hallway, and I hold my breath. The shadow stops, too, and I get the feeling that whatever it is might be holding its own breath. Finally, the tension gets to me, and I clear my throat nervously. <clears throat> Carl? Chase? Carl! I let out a gasp of relief and almost sagged on the wall. More clopping of footsteps and Carl appears around the corner. His eyes are wide and his nostrils flare. He stumbles up to me, his hands clasped together nervously. Holy shit, dude, it is so fucking good to see you! I press up harder against the wall, taking more weight off of my foot. What the hell is going on? I... I don't know, I just woke up. You okay? He looks at me, then down at my foot. Are you hurt? I gesture up at the ladder. I fell down that thing. Carl looks up at the ladder and the dark hole it leads up to. What were you doing up there? I don't know. I just woke up in the dark and tried to crawl out. Shit. Carl bends down to look at my ankle, which is clearly starting to swell. Can you walk? I think so. Kind of. He stands back up and looks around. Jeez, I don't know what's going on. I just woke up in the bedroom of the hall like 20 minutes ago. Is this... Is this not part of your house? Carl lets out a bre breathy, incredulous laugh. <laughs> no, definitely not. I was trying to find a window, but I can't. Maybe we're in a basement or something? 
The last thing I remember is your crawl space. Why would they have an attic in a basement? I look back over the dark hole in the ceiling. Maybe it's not an attic. Chase, I'm freaking out. And it shows, too. His breathing is picking up, his wide nostrils flaring again. I reach out and put a hand on his shoulder, giving some reassuring squeezes. No, no, it's okay. Maybe we got really high or drunk or something. What's the last thing you remember? Carl starts clicking his fingers together again, looking away, up the hall. Uh, um, the lake? Yeah, I remember we went back to your house, then down to the basement, and then... Carl frowns. I don't remember. I watch him carefully. But then I remember looking behind the plastic bins, and there was this... HELP! We both jump as the screen comes from right down the hall. Carl and I both look at each other, wide-eyed. What the hell? Hello? Is someone out there? That sounds like Raven. Carl starts to hesitantly walk up the hallway and I move to follow, and immediately regret it as I put weight on my ankle. It's completely stiff now and pain shoots up into my shin like lightning. My gasping causes Carl to turn around in confusion, then his eyes light up when he sees my leg. Oh shit, here. He reaches out and I wrap an arm around his neck. He's sturdy and strong, easy to lean against, and I sigh with relief as I take the weight off my injured ankle. Somebody! We hobble our way down the hall, following the sound of Raven's panicked voice. We take a left at the end of the hall and are confronted with an almost ident identical hallway to the last. That's when I start to smell smoke. Do you smell that? Carl puts his nose up. Something burning? Help me! I almost jump again as the sound comes from right to our, right on our left, the only door on the left side of the hallway. We both look at the door for a moment. Carl's ears perk straight up. And we both jump again as the door shakes from several heavy bashes that rattle the frame. Help! The cry is mournful, like he's given up. Raven? The shaking and pounding stops. Carl? Carl! The voice instantly turns hopeful and the voice grows muffled, as if Raven is pressing his muzzle right up against the door. I'm... I'm stuck! The door won't open! And there's a fire! What? Chase? There's something burning on the stove or something! I can't see it! Me and Carl look at each other in bewilderment. Guys? It's getting really smoky in here! I can't really see anything! He gives a cough. <coughs> and it's really hard to breathe! Alright, hold on a sec, man. We'll get you out. Carl shifts me to the wall so I can lean against it, then tries the doorknob. The knob barely turns, clearly locked. Shit. Yeah, it's locked. It's getting really hot in here. Hold on. Carl shoves his shoulder up against the door. He gives a few creaks, but otherwise stays solid. Please help. His plaintive whimpering is barely audible through the thick wood. What kind of lock is it? Maybe we could pick it? Carl studies the knob. Uh, I don't think a paperclip is going to work. I lean in to look and find myself staring at an old-fashioned keyhole. The hell? Raven, can't you unlock it from that side? No, there's nothing there! Guys, I can't breathe! His voice is getting desperate again. There's no other way out? No other door in there? Raven doesn't answer, and Carl and I both wait for a good ten seconds. Raven? Ah! We both jump for the third time before Carl presses his face up to the door. Raven? Raven, what happened? For a few seconds, all we hear is coughs. Then Raven's voice is lower, up against the bottom of the door as if he's laying down. Something! Something in the smoke! Help! What? What's in the smoke? My mind flashes back to what I heard in the attic. Something! Can't see! Open the door! Fuck. Alright man, stand back! I don't know if he's talking to me or Raven, but I take a step back anyway. Carl takes a few steps back, then throws his body forward, smashing up against the door. It shudders a little bit, and I hear a crack or two, but otherwise there's no change. He tries it again with the same result. Carl, I don't think that's gonna work! 
Carl doesn't say anything, instead backing up until his back touches the opposite wall. He takes a deep breath, then charges forward, his head down this time. Instinctively, I close my eyes, imagining Carl snapping his neck right in front of me. The impact is much louder this time, and it's accompanied by a crunch. When I open my eyes, it's not Carl's neck that's broken, but rather the wooden door. Excuse me, I need a drink after all that shouting. <laughs> Carl's head is completely busted through the door so that his head is poking into the other side. I stare, expecting to see the tendrils of black smoke sneaking out of the broken door, but there's nothing. Carl sets his hands on either side of the door, apparently taking a look around. Raven, you okay? I walk up to Carl's side to put a hand on his back. Carl, what is it? Is there a fire? Carl raises himself up against the door before pushing back yanking his head out of the opening. He comes up with a bunch of wooden splinters clinging to his head fur and beard and sweatshirt. Nothing. I duck down and look through the opening as well, taking care to keep weight off my injured foot. I'm greeted to the sight of a brightly lit dining room and kitchen, but it's clear, no smoke in sight. It was... it was completely black in here a second ago. I look down at the trembling voice of Raven below me and see the husky curled up, his head poking up from his fetal position. Hey, Chase. Uh, hi. I don't know what happened. There was smoke everywhere. It's like when you opened the door, it all got sucked out. I sniff, and now I can't even get a whiff of smoke, aside from the residual taste I still have of it in the back of my throat. I hear a click next to my head and look over to see the doorknob twist. I pull my head out of the hole and Carl pulls the door open. Are you kidding me? It was locked, right? It was definitely locked. Raven gets up, brushing shaky hands down his shirt. You okay, man? Yeah, yeah, just thought I was going to die for a second. <laughs> I watch as Raven struggles to keep his ears perked. What happened? Raven takes a deep breath. I don't know. I just woke up in here and smoke just started coming out from the stove or oven or something. You said you saw something? Y yeah something in the smoke. It looks like arms or something. Carl and I look at each other. But it might have just been the smoke. I look around the room, scanning it for any sign of the black smoke that Raven was so adamant about having seen. I don't think he was just seeing things because I'm pretty sure I hadn't imagined the smell. I promise I'm not lying. It's just what I saw. I think the bigger issue here is that we're here at all. I mean, where the hell is here? I spread my hands out, giving an incredulous laugh. I... I thought maybe it was just another part of your house? Raven looks at Carl. I mean, I went downstairs after you guys and found this hole. Then everything went dark. Carl looks down. Same here. I followed Carl. We both look at Carl, but he doesn't say anything instead just moving past Raven into the large kitchen next to the dining room. I have a laugh for him, then reach out to lean against the counter. I try to gather my thoughts. Everything still feels dreamlike, surreal, and my thoughts are sluggish. Carl, do you have any idea what happened? I mean, that hole. Did you go there too? Carl sets his hands on his hips, eyes wandering around the room. Honestly, I can't remember anything that happened after the lake, man. Raven casts a sidelong look at me before moving next to Carl. Well, maybe it will just take you a second before you can remember. I was really confused when I woke up here. I was curled up over there on that counter. Raven points to a marble top counter, under a row of over a dozen pans hanging from a fixture attached to the ceiling. We stand there in silence as, I imagine, we individually absorb this, the situation we're in. Carl, are you sure this isn't some extension of your house? Maybe something that leads out of the crawl space? The ram laughs, but it definitely isn't genuine. <laughs> Dude, I think I'd know if this was some part of my house. Unless my parents have just been building this secret kitchen underground for who knows how long. I glance at the lighting, which is definitely electric, then over at what, at what looks like an electric stove. 
While everything sort of looked old-fashioned, there was a mixture of modernity to it as well. Where else could we be? Raven and I remember going to the crawl space, then losing consciousness after we found that hole, which is where you went, Carl. Carl finally does turn to look- Excuse me, let me try that again. Carl finally does turn to me at that point, his brow furrowed. Do you think I had something to do with this? Even though I was implying that he might know more, Carl's sudden jump to being defensive catches me by surprise. No! I just wonder if you might have any more ideas since it's your house, you know? Carl laughs again. I'm struck by the fullness of it. Usually when Carl laughed, it was crackly and half-hearted. Now it's loud and a little abrasive. <laughs> Think I just waited in the shadows and jugged you all up with acid or some shit? I don't respond, just watching Carl as he stares back at me, breathing hard. Raven coughs loudly. <coughs> hey guys, let's calm down. You know, I'm kinda hungry. Why don't we make some food? That seems to break Carl out of his stare down with me, as he looks over at Raven and huffs out one of his more characteristic chuckles. <laughs> really, Raven? Yeah, that always makes me feel better. Raven starts opening cupboards, but each one is empty. Carl turns back to me, frowning. Sorry, Chase. I'm just fucking freaked out, too. Thing is, I don't think we're in my house anymore. He chuckles again. <laughs> I mean, are we even in Echo? What time is it, anyway? I reach in my pocket to check my phone, and that's when I remember I have a fucking phone. I almost jump with the realization and shove a hand into my pocket to pull it out. Why didn't I think of that before? What? Phone! I pull it out excitedly and hit the button to turn the screen on. And to met with a black screen. My phone's dead. Are you kidding me? I hold the power button down, but nothing happens. I look up to see Raven and Carl getting similar results. Raven shaking his as if that's going to help. Carl shakes his head. Were we out that long? This is crazy. I press a hand on my face for the moment, for a moment, the idea that this could still be some sort of dream coming to mind. I remember taking an overnight job back when I was a freshman and how that had fucked up my sleeping schedule. That in turn gave me all kinds of fucked up, realistic dreams. Sleep paralysis plagued me to the ends of my wits, and I remember one time I thought I'd never be able to get up. I was stuck in bed, but each time I sat up and thought it was over, I'd end up sort of waking up again still lying down, stuck in my paralysis. Dreams within dreams within dreams. No food either. My scattered thoughts collect together long enough for me to decide on the next course of action we should take. Alright, this is stupid. We should go out and look around. We'll find the way out eventually. Yeah. Yeah, we need to do that. I looked around a little, but didn't find anything. I grip the counter a little more tightly as I feel a slight wave of dizziness come over me making everything feel even less real. But the pain that's shooting up from my ankle is very real, and just a glance down at the ever-growing swelling confirms it. The suspicion that we'd somehow been drugged grows, but I don't want to upset Carl again, so I don't mention it. Okay, yeah. Let's, uh, let's just stick together and go. We'll find the way out. Aw, I am hungry. We can eat when we get out. There's no food here anyway, excuse me. I turn and, even though I do it as lightly as possible, the moment I set my right foot down feels like a hundred needles pressed into my ankle. Oh, fuck! Carl's at my side instantly, reaching out a hand to steady me. Dude, you alright? What happened? I lean all my weight on the counter at that point. Just letting my foot dangle as I hold it off the ground is painful. He fell down a ladder and landed on his foot wrong. What? But it's only now that it's really starting to hurt. I say it through gritted teeth. The pain is actually making me sweat, and I'm realizing that I might have done more than just sprain it. I don't think I can walk like this. How did you fall down a ladder? He woke up in an attic. Here. Carl hunches down in front of me. My stupefied brain thinks of a butt sex joke, but I managed to keep it canned. Really, Chase? <laughs> you sure? 
I could just lean against you. That'll take too long. Besides, it looks like you can't walk at all right now. Hesitantly, I let go of the counter and let myself sort of fall forward onto the ram's back. He's sturdy and barely budges as I lean all my weight onto him. Carl reaches back with both hands and hitches my legs off the ground as he stands, and I feel all the muscles in his back flex as he does. Damn, Carl. You work out? Carl grunts. A little bit. I move my head to the side to keep from knocking my nose against his horns. It's a smart move, because just then Carl nods his head in Raven's direction. Hey, I know this is kind of fucked up, but maybe grab a kitchen knife? Raven raises an eyebrow at Carl. Why? I immediately see what Carl's getting at. We have no idea where we are, or who put us here. Might be safe to be ready to defend ourselves, you know? And you said you saw something in the smoke. Raven's eyes widen, but he reaches out to slowly pull a knife from a silver-looking knife block. The husky frowns at the shing sound it makes. His ears down and elbows in, it's clear he's never used anything as a weapon before. But I can't blame him, neither have I. I don't know if I should be the one to do it, though. Well, you're not strong enough to hold Chase, so I've got my hands tied. He looks back at me. If anything happens, though, I'll have to drop you and help him out, okay, man? I chuckle softly. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Let's just hope that doesn't have to happen. And with the shaky husky in the lead, we set off back into the hallway. Immediately, it's clear that wherever we are isn't very large. Four ident identical hallways lead us around in a perfect square. Each hallway has three doors on the right, one on the left, and a hatch in the ceiling that leads to the attic. What also becomes immediately clear is that the door on the left leads into the kitchen, but from the kitchen there's only that one door out. Each time we open the door to the kitchen, we come to realize that the angle in which we enter it is the same. The first time this happens we're mostly just confused, wondering if maybe we backtracked somehow. After the second time, though, Raven laughs. This isn't real! <laughs> we're on drugs or something! But we're all seeing the same thing? Or I'm just having this dream and none of you are real, eh? The husky's voice is bordering on crazy. That, paired with his grin, paired with him holding a knife, is slightly disconcerting. Carl huffs, hitching me up higher on his shoulders. Alright, calm down. Just don't think about it. Let's try the other doors. I'm a little surprised at how well Carl is taking all of this. I wonder if part of it has to do with any of the weed that might still be in the system. We start trying the doors on the right, and this time things are different. The first door opens up to a wall, just an extension of the beige color of the wall surrounding it. We stare at it for a few moments, and for the first time we had a deep, unsettling terror in the pit of my stomach. I manage to keep it from rising to the surface. But all this bizarre imagery combined with the surreal haze is making me feel sick and claustrophobic. Bummer, that's definitely not the way out. On to the next door! Carl chuckles again, and I feel myself clinging to his attempt at humor just to keep myself sane. The next door opens up to what looks like a bathroom. It's definitely not a modern one though, since it's complete with a pull chain from the high tank. Well, at least we've got all the essentials, right? The next door reveals a room full of tools and chains hanging from the ceiling, along with a sawhorse. The walls, though, are lined with wooden planks, and Carl gently sets me against the hallway wall before hurrying in and peering at the wood. Fuck, it's just concrete behind it. I don't bother to ask what the hell is going on again. I'm just starting to accept that where we are can't be explained. More doors are opened, twelve in all. One is completely white and empty. Another contains a frilly bedroom, which is where Carl says he woke up. Further along, we come across what looks like an office, along with a room decorated with sofas and a chandelier. When we reach one of the doors in the last hall, though, something is different. The first thing I notice is the smell. Though it's faint, I can tell it's sweet in the most disgusting way possible. Ugh, what is that? Raven holds up a hand to his nose as we approach the second to last door in the main hall. This one is clearly damaged. The wood is splintered in the middle, bulging out slightly as if it had been punched from the other side. We all stare at it for a moment, the smell growing stronger. Then it hits me. Oh god, do you think... 
I can't finish, covering my muzzle with both hands. Raven, who had been right up next to the door, steps back with an arm up around his face, looking like he's about to throw up. I imagine the smell is a lot worse for him. M maybe we should skip this one. For now. Carl hesitates, then gently sets me down against the wall again. We need to check every door. This could be the way out, you know? He looks back at me, but I don't say anything, just grimacing at the door. He holds out a hand to Raven. Knife. After handing it over, Raven takes several more steps back, further up the hall. I press my hands to my muzzle, readying myself to shut my eyes. As Carl turns the knob, I grit my teeth. This room has no illumination, therefore we have to rely on the light from the hallway to see inside. As the light from the opening door spreads across the room, I see that it's rather simple. The walls are concrete, peppered with craters and rocks. The floor is smoother, but with webs of cracks in its surface. I can't see the ceiling, but I do see what's hanging from it. Once the door opens completely, there's enough light to fully take in exactly what it is. A noose. Frayed and old-looking, but unmistakably a noose. Carl stares at it, then sticks his head in further to look back and forth before stepping back to close the door. What was it? Raven calls up from the hall, his hands clasped nervously together. I notice then that the rotting smell is completely gone now, instead of getting stronger when Carl opened the door. Nothing. Empty room. I see Carl visibly trying to keep his breathing under control as he holds the knife out to Raven before bending down in front of me again. Really? Oh, thank God. Carl trembles as he stands up with me in tow. As the husky moves on to the final door, I lean in next to Carl's cheek. You okay? Did you see anything? He turns his head towards mine, touching his cheek to mine. Aside from the rope? No. It's hard to say whether or not I believe him, or if he's just trying to protect me from whatever else he saw in there. Either way, I don't press for it. The last door is locked. It's big and made of small logs. Its deep brown color contrasts with all the others. Raven jiggles the handle a few times and Carl tries to look into the cracks between the logs, but it's completely black. So that's it. That's all the doors. I'm starting to feel a certain level of panic again now that we know that we're stuck. Carl, I think, picks up on that and comes over to where I'm leaning against the wall to set a hand on my shoulder. It's alright, man. We haven't checked the attic either. I mean, there aren't any windows, so like you said, we're probably in a basement or something, right? The reassuring hand feels good, but it's not exactly enough to keep me from feeling a certain level of despair. Honestly, I think I'm still dreaming right now. Carl, Carl doesn't say anything to that. Raven sidles up next to us. Well, dream or not, I'm still pretty hungry. We both glance at, La at Raven, and they can't help but give a little laugh at the grin on his face. I guess... At least for now, it's best to just not think about it. We head back to the kitchen, which doesn't take very long because every door on the left leads to it. We all split up to search the many cupboards and drawers of the kitchen for food. We come up mostly empty, only finding silverware and cooking utensils here and there. Because of my injury, I cover a lot less ground, only able to hobble around along the counter, using it as a crutch as I move down a line of cupboards. Even if we were able to find any food, there's no way I'd be able to cook it. The only thing I'd ever been able to make on my own was a grilled cheese sandwich back when I was in high school. Even then, I'd almost burned down the house when I dropped a piece of bread on the gas stove. In a panic, I threw the flaming bread across the kitchen into the living room. I smile at the memory as I open the last cupboard along the wall. And right in front of me is a block of cheese on a glass plate. Next to it is a loaf of bread and plastic bagging, and a small square of butter wrapped in wax paper. I stare for a moment, waiting for the food in front of me to disappear. I even blink a few times to be sure. Uh, guys? What's up? You seeing this? What? Cheese, bread, and butter. I stand to the side and Raven perks up. Ooh, you found food! I swear I already checked that cupboard! Raven is next to me a few seconds later, reaching in to take out the food. 
For a moment, I swear the bread blurs as he pulls it out, and I have to shut my eyes for a moment to keep from feeling sick. I feel Carl support me from behind with his hands on my shoulders. Whoa, dude. You alright, Chase? I grab onto the counter again. Y yeah it's just... Carl waits for a moment. What? I just... I was thinking about grilled cheese before I opened the cupboard. Like, you just wanted a grilled cheese sandwich really badly and it popped up? Sort of. Huh. Carl walks up to the bread and bends over, observing it closely. It looks real. It is real! Raven walks up to the cupboard where he had pulled the food from and closes it. Alright, I'm wishing for... a steak! He closes his eyes for a moment, then reaches out to pull the cupboard back open, smiling expectantly. It's empty. Well, grilled cheese isn't bad. Raven moves down the counter to grab one of the pans hanging from the rack. Carl moves over to my side as Raven turns the gas stove on with a click 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 of the igniter. Dude, I think one of the important things to do right now is to stop questioning this place. We just can't make sense of it. I fold my arms. It has to be a dream. Carl puts an arm around me. Maybe. But dude, I'm just glad I'm not here alone. I nod in agreement. Yeah, I don't think I'd be able to deal with that. Let's just take it one step at a time for now, man. I manage a small smile. Are you high right now? Carl laughs. <laughs> man, I wish. I hear the sizzling of the melting butter as Raven plops it in the pan. Carl and I go about setting slices of cheese in the bread as Raven starts searing them. The action of making food is enough to calm me down, at least a little, and the other two keeping high spirits lifts mine. Before long, there are six grilled cheese sandwiches stacked on a plate. They look good, but after the first bite, I almost let the food fall back out of my mouth. What the fuck? I look over to see Carl and Raven pu pulling similar faces. Ugh, it kind of tastes like chalk. You know what chalk tastes like? Yeah, I ate some when I was a kid. He has a point. It's dry and crumbly, almost inedible. Well... It still sort of tastes like grilled cheese. Sort of. I don't think this is food. It's not that bad. Besides, it's all we've got. Raven forces another bite, and so does Carl. I can't bring myself to do it. My ankle, the smoke, the dead body smell and noose. It's all too much for me to deal with right now. I watch Carl and Raven talk back and forth. And I'm again struck by how surreal this all feels. I think back to the time I first got stoned from a stupid pot muffin, how nothing felt real, how I felt like I wasn't in control. It's like that, only ten times worse. I wonder if the others feel the same. Something ebbs to the surface of my mind, trying to break through the veil of fog shrouding it. What are we doing? Why are we sitting here eating when we should be trying to figure out a way to get the fuck out? I open my mouth. I struggle to keep my food down and instead choose to look hard at the tablecloth. You not hungry? Raven is looking intently at my half-finished sandwich. Nah, you can have it. I slide my glass plate across the table to Raven. Carl watches me but doesn't say anything slowly chewing. I subconsciously note that he'd eaten around the crust, leaving those on his plate. We start discussing what else we might be able to do here, other possibilities on how we could get out. The attic is really the only place we haven't been yet, but because it's so dark, we're not so sure about going. Well, why don't we sleep on it and figure out what we'll do when we wake up? Raven yawns widely. <sighs> that sounds good to me. Feels like it's been hours. It does feel that way, but without our phones it's really impossible to tell. Leaving our plates where they are on the table, Raven leads us back out into the hallway. It takes us a few minutes to find the right door, considering everything looks identical, that we take special care to avoid the damaged door. As Raven moves into the bedroom, Carl leans against the wall, turning his head to, to talk back to me. Hey, we're gonna be alright, okay? 
I look back at the one green eye I can see and will myself to squash the boiling pit of dread in my stomach. Okay, it's just that I can't believe this is happening, you know? I gotcha. I just want you to know I'll be here for you, okay? I look back at his gaze for a while, to the point where I think he's getting uncomfortable. I sigh. You guys are just acting really weird about all of this. Yeah? Well, I guess Raven is being Raven, but you're acting... different. Really? No. Oh. I swallow. Just yesterday you were throwing up over a job interview. Now you're the level-headed one while I'm freaking out. I laugh a little. <laughs> I just don't understand what's going on is all. Carl sets me down against the wall, then turns to me with a hug. Hey man, I don't know either. I'm just trying to keep it together too. The hug surprises me, but I take it gratefully. I stare over his shoulder at the uniform hallway. Despite Carl's efforts, the worrying feeling returns. Raven pokes his head around the doorway. Hey guys, that little sofa thing is awesome. I'll sleep there, you two can have the bed. And on that note, we will leave off here for now. We will pick up and continue on with Carl's route next time as we go through Sunday, which is probably going to be very long and will have to be broken up into multiple parts if Leo's route was any indication. But until then, uh, thank y'all for watching. I appreciate it. I'll see you next time. Bye!